Oh. All right, I need to go live. Please give me about yep. 15 seconds. Yep. Morning limestone and hello world. If you're just joining us, this is a Blue Shift Aerospace live stream of the launch of Stardust 1.0. This is our second launch attempt. Previous event on January 15th was uh, scrubbed due to low cloud cover, a problem which we will not be having today. The launch was scheduled for 10. Uh, there is uh, likely a delay announcement pending. Uh, so probably we're looking at 11. Uh, it's not confirmed just yet. Apologies for the uh, audio. The cold's uh, wreaked just a little bit of havoc here. Um, so we're going to see what we can do to improve the microphones and uh, bring some of those onboard cameras online for everybody. All right, this is a voice test of mic one, but we just swapped out the mic. Testing for fuzz.
Okay. Testing again. And with the uh, bulk of audio issues sorted out there, if you're just joining, this is a Blue Shift Aerospace live stream of the launch of Stardust 1.0. Uh, it's now looking like 11 is probably the launch time. We're waiting on confirmation from uh, Mission Control. Although the spacecraft recovery co uh, mechanic really doesn't have enough snowmobiles involved, if, if you ask my opinion. We're uh, having a little freeze here. Alright, uh, we've got a little bit of freezing on the live stream here. We've got two workings to realign our antennas a little bit.
you're just joining us. This is a Blue Shift Aerospace live stream of the launch of Stardust 1.0, our prototype uh, sounding rocket. This will be the first commercial rocket launch here in the state of Maine, and the first commercial rocket launch powered by a biodrived fuel uh, in the world. If you're just joining us, this is a Blue Shift Aerospace live stream of the launch of Stardust 1.0, Maine's first commercial rocket launch, and the first commercial rocket launch powered by a bio-derived fuel in the world. Uh, we're transmitting just fine on 92.9 FM for folks here in person to view the launch. And uh, it sounds like audio is not going through to YouTube. So uh, stand by as we troubleshoot that real quick. If you're just joining us, this is a Blue Shift Aerospace live stream. The launch of Stardust 1.0, Maine's first commercial rocket launch, and the first commercial rocket launch powered by a bio-derived uh, fuel in the world. Testing audio again. All right, folks, uh, thanks for your patience as we troubleshoot here. If you're uh, just joining us, this is a Blue Shift Aerospace live stream of the launch of Stardust 1.0, means first commercial launch and the first commercial launch powered by a biodrived fuel in the world, possibly in the entirety of the cosmos.
we had a, a little bit of a lag in the system. Uh, that was a uh, fairly mundane issue. Uh, one of our uh, computers on the system decided that this was a good time to uh, update Windows. That took a little bit of bandwidth, uh, but we're all set now. As you can see, beautiful blue sky day here in Limestone, Maine.
If you're just joining us, this is a Blue Shift Aerospace live stream. The launch of Stardust 1.0 means first commercial launch and the first commercial launch powered by a bio-derived fuel in the world. Currently, oxidizer uh, tank is pressurized. We're now heating. And uh, Sasha Derry, founder and CEO, had a moment to, uh, to drop by. Sasha, how's it going? Uh, it's going going much better than it was uh, about two hours ago. We <laughs> <laughs> probably shared with folks we were at. When I drove the truck out to uh, the launcher this morning, it was minus 14 degrees Fahrenheit. I think that's like minus 22 or so degrees Celsius. <laughs> and uh, it, it was a warm, you know. It was. It was uh, <laughs> let's say uh, yesterday was a warmer day than it was today. It, it was really cold yesterday. So, um, what we didn't plan on was, well, temperatures that cold, and it, uh, they are causing problems with uh, the electronics, uh, and we have some networking equipment that is was failing. Uh, fortunately, we've, we've man managed to warm those up, and um, things are actually looking pretty good right now. Uh, we, have, we do have a heater in the rocket. It wasn't originally intended to warm the whole rocket up, but we've been able to tap that a couple times to... Um, to get things going, uh, and we are we're looking we're looking good for a 10:30 ish Eastern time launch this morning. Uh, we just called into the FAA. The cloud cover it, we do have seed cloud cover coming in. However, it is up high and it's not to our our um, it's not it's above our the highest our apogee of launch. So we are we are feeling kind of optimistic that we may make history today. Good, good, good. Sorry, I, in all honesty, I was trying to get some hot hands into my gloves. <laughs> but thank you for the update, Sasha. Yes. Uh, only at first. Today, ladies and gentlemen, the indefatigable leader of our Dauntless team. It's really not that bad, the cold.
Just joining us, this is a Blue Shift Aerospace live stream. The launch of Stardust 1.0, this will be the first commercial rocket launch and the first commercial rocket launch powered by a biodrived fuel in the world. At this point, it uh, looks like launch will be at approximately 10.30 a.m. Eastern. Oxidizer tank is filled and rising to nominal pressure. And uh, the engineers have uh, retreated to launch operations. Uh, at this point, uh, we begin bringing a couple additional uh, systems on board the rocket online in preparation for our final launch status check. So uh, at this point, it's looking about uh, T minus 35 minutes. To lift off.
And uh, if you're just joining us, this is a Blue Shift Airspace live stream of the launch of Stardust 1.0. Its first commercial rocket launch, and the first commercial rocket launch uh, powered by bi-derived fuel in the world. I'm Seth Lockman, the comms director. And I'm sorry to announce uh, that at this time we are holding for weather. We've got clouds below the flight ceiling again. difference uh, being that uh, there's a pretty good chance we get another window shortly. So uh, just hold tight everybody and uh, we'll launch this thing as soon as we can. Stardust itself is uh, all systems go, uh, just about as ready for flight as a rocket can be. Just uh, waiting for the clouds to rise over the forming Loring, sorry, over the former Loring Air Force Base.
If you're just joining us, this is a Blue Shift Aerospace live stream of the launch of Stardust 1.0. This will be Maine's first commercial rocket launch, and the first commercial rocket launch of a uh, rocket powered with a biodrived fuel uh, anywhere in the world. We are currently holding for weather. The clouds have come in a little lower than the flight ceiling, so we cannot launch at this time. All systems go aboard the rocket. The team is uh, maintaining high spirits and uh, reasonable core temperatures as we continue to stand by.
All right, well, uh, we've come into a little bit of time here as we wait for weather. Uh, so let's go to uh, viewer questions. Uh, if anyone uh, in our public viewing area has a question, uh, feel free to write it down and pass it to one of our uh, parking attendants in the orange jacket. They'll bring it on up to me. But uh, from the control booth here, where my breath is turning into snow, let's take a couple questions from the viewers here on YouTube. Do you know the launch window, or uh, is it uh, essentially whenever they like, asks Ben Fry. Good question, Ben. Um, for this type of launch, uh, there's no rendezvous, so we don't uh, really need split-second uh, timing on the launch uh, for that type of a window, because it's just a suborbital hop. Uh, we do, however, need uh, suitable uh, weather conditions. Uh, the two uh, kind of main parameters here are we need a cloud cover of less than 50% up to our flight ceiling or apogee. Uh, in this case, that's about 5,200 feet above uh, sea level, and that is uh, the condition that we're not uh, able to meet with the weather just now. The uh, second thing is uh, winds of around six miles an hour or lower, and uh, we're doing all right on that. And uh, just got an update from Sasha Derry, founder and CEO of Blue Shift, that uh, we are getting uh, an opening in the cloud cover. So there is a decent chance here that we launch uh, precisely <laughs> on on our amended schedule, a uh, liftoff at 10.30 a.m. Eastern. Miguel uh, Guerrero asks, uh, are there onboard cameras? Yes, uh, they are not active just now to save power, uh, but about uh, 10 to 15 minutes prior to launch, so uh, imminent at this point. Uh, we're going to bring uh, all of the payload bases systems online, uh, and that will include some onboard cameras. We uh, do look forward to giving you some onboard uh, uh, flight video. If for some reason the uh, onboard video fails, then uh, there's this camera which is mounted on uh, a series of radio dishes, and that's our telemetry downlink, and this will be trained on the rocket. So uh, we should have some excellent views one way or the other. No day 58 asks, uh, is anything in it? Well, of course, the rocket contains our proprietary uh, bio-derived fuel. Uh, it's non-toxic. Uh, it's very nearly carbon neutral. And uh, affordably sourceable from farms across America. Uh, making it the first commercial launch of a rocket powered by such a bio-derived fuel, however. Uh, we've got three CubeSats uh, from paying customers aboard. Uh, there's an academic payload uh, from Falmouth High School. 
Now the team there worked with uh, the University of Maine at Orono and the University of Southern Maine in Portland. The original Portland. Well, in America. They worked with the best Portland to outfit their CubeSat prototype with a GoPro, radio transmitter, and X in a box chips to collect flight data, including acceleration pressure, temperature, and humidity. And uh, this was not their first CubeSat found with high school, leads the state, we believe, in CubeSat production. They also collaborated with UMaine and USM on MeSat 1, Maine's first orbital CubeSat. Their HAB payload will fly aboard MESAT-1, testing uh, early detection methods for harmful algal blooms, thus HAB. Using a wide-spectrum light sensor, basically a, a modified camera, uh, to detect specific wavelengths associated with HABs in freshwater lakes. The CubeSat that they'll be flying with us uh, today with the X in a box system will be their first CubeSat prototype uh, with the 3U form factor. So CubeSat is uh, uh, a, a kind of standardized form factor of, of nano satellite or very small satellite. It's a little bigger than a Rubik's Cube. It's about 10 centimeters to a side, and that's one U, one standard unit. The way things are developing, the, uh, the more common form factor really seems to be 3U, or 10 by 10 by 30 centimeters. Our CubeSat enclosures um, are actually big enough to hold a 3U CubeSat. Now that may change down the road, but the way we do things currently, you can either just build a 3U CubeSat and send it to us, or we can send you the enclosure and you can make use of that little bit of extra space. Other, uh, Clients include Kellogg's Research Labs. Uh, these guys are going to test the vibration dampening properties of nitinol, a shape memory alloy of nickel and titanium, in the conditions of a rocket launch. The idea is to test uh, nitinol uh, bushings to absorb the vibrations of rocket launch for payload bays in, in future rockets. This would also improve the efficiency of the rocket, uh, just because there's uh, less uh, material shifting about uh, inside. And it would address the issue of many CubeSats um, arriving on orbit with damage due to the intense vibrations. Uh, so they'll be running a test. They've got a, uh, a control CubeSat and then a uh, a 1U, and then a, a also another 1U uh, with kind of a, a prototype nitinol bushing, and they're going to compare how the vibration of, uh, of launch board Stardust affects the two 1U CubeSats within the larger 3U enclosure. And uh, perhaps our least conventional payload, Rocket Insights, will be filling their CubeSat enclosure with traditional Dutch wafer cookies called Stroop Waffles in homage to their Amsterdam-based parent company, Dept. But that's not all. Also aboard their CubeSat payload are some samples of tourmaline. I mean, is known for producing some of the finest tourmaline in the world. And uh, they're kind of going to zig where Kellogg's uh, zagged. 
And rather than try and dampen the vibration of launch, uh, they're going to try and use launch vibration and G-loading and the agitation associated with uh, separation and parachute deployment and landing to tumble the tourmaline. Now, uh, launching from limestone uh, is significant, uh, not just because I'm a graduate of the main school of science and math, and it's nice to be back, uh, but we also hope to figuratively uh, break ground for Spaceport Maine. And back in the summer of 2017, the Maine Space Grant Consortium began seriously considering bold new initiatives to support economic growth here. And one of the ideas that uh, got bandied about was to leverage our ideal geography, our high latitude, our south-facing coastline uh, with ocean overflight to polar orbit. Uh, existing aerospace activity, which a lot of people don't realize just how much is going on in the state already and our Cold War infrastructure. Uh, we've already got uh, amazing facilities, the b former Brunswick Naval Air Station and uh, the former Loring Air Force Base here. And uh, so what came from all of, these, uh, all of these things and all these institutions, uh, educational institutions, economic development authorities, uh, revitalizing uh, both of those bases. What came together was a plan to launch small rockets like our own uh, and others uh, from planes and horizontal launch and also launch pads and vertical launch on suborbital hops and also to polar low earth orbit. And this would be from a network of sites across the state. Now, as the communications director, um, I get to talk with a lot of people about what we're doing. And uh, less nowadays, but a couple years ago, it was basically inevitable that uh, the phrase, that's crazy, would come up during the conversation. I'll grant you that a spaceport would definitely be a kind of significant departure from our world-class microbrews and blueberries and lobster. But once you know about our existing educational programs and infrastructure for aerospace, you'll, you'll realize pretty quick that a spaceport would really be a kind of a small step rather than a giant leap for mankind.
So the facilities here at uh, at Loring, there's a tremendous potential for future as an R&D facility and uh, for suborbital launch. Uh, the runway here could be used for ver uh, horizontal launch very easily. Very little refurbishment required. For vertical launch, uh, we're probably looking at a Especially for larger rockets, we're probably looking at a, um, a coastal down east launch site with that ocean overflight to polar orbit. And uh, mission control would probably be down in Brunswick, uh, at Brunswick Landing, along with the Tech Place uh, Business Incubator. Uh, the Loring Development Authority has been absolutely uh, amazing to us uh, since since we got here and before we got here, uh, both times. Uh, gave us a beautiful field office, helped uh, plow the runways and the taxiways. from Luke Sandin, Senior Mechanical Engineer. Here at Blue Shift is uh, tentatively 10.45 for launch.
Oh, we have a signal. Blessed, blessed signal. Blessed. This is improved once we clear the tower. This is a lateral facing uh, camera looking outward from Stardust's Payload Bay area. And you can see uh, the ground and the launch rail. And the view should uh, improve not only in quality but also in uh, what we're seeing with altitude.
And launch is imminent. And stand by. Launch is now imminent. Testing, testing, one, two, three. Ready? Take it away, Brooke. All right, launch controls and George here. Everyone ready? All right, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, Five, four, three, two, one, zero. Ignition started. We have a siren going off. No. Uh, it dumped. It dumped. That's dumping nitrous. Oh, it's got fire though. It it's not launching. Well, stand by everybody. Yeah. Well, uh, clearly the uh, igniter is performing nominally. Uh, probably uh, some sort of issue with the main fuel valve. All right, well, uh, stand by, folks. We're going to uh, assess and almost certainly reattempt.
Looks like the uh, igniter motor did fire, but the main engine did not. Okay, we are uh, going to try it again. Stand by. Launch remains imminent. So, so, am I doing the whole thing again? Yes, sir. Um. So one thing to check is... All right, sounds like uh, Control is running a series of system checks. Please do bear with us. On the whole, things are still looking good to uh, get Stardust in the air.
If you're just joining us, uh, this is a Blue Shift Aerospace live stream of the launch of Stardust 1.0, Maine's first commercial rocket launch and the first commercial rocket launch powered by bio-derived fuel in the world. Uh, the weather is uh, keeping fair for the time being. Uh, we attempted a uh, launch just a few minutes ago. The uh, igniter performed nominally, but the main valve did not open, so the main engine uh, was not able to fire. So we're uh, running a systems check now and planning next steps. Thanks for staying with us as we make history.
And uh, it sounds like we're entering into a troubleshooting hold for 20 minutes. Oh, you heard Uh, quick update. Troubleshooting is uh, all done. We uh, just need to bring the oxidizer back up to temperature. We'll reattempt the launch. Uh, that process should take about 20 minutes.
and uh, this is a Blue Shift Airspace live stream of the launch of Stardust 1.0. Means first commercial rocket launch and the first commercial rocket launch powered by a bio-derived uh, fuel. did a launch earlier today. Uh, there was an issue with the uh, pressure behind the main valve. That's been fixed and at this time uh, we're back to all systems go. Just uh, reheating the oxidizer to the nominal temperature for flight. Great. Word from uh, Mission Control is that launch is imminent.
Well, if you're just joining us, it's a Blue Shift Aerospace live stream. Of the launch of Stardust 1.0. Now, yeah, at this time, uh, looks like there's uh, a, an issue with one of the systems in the lower payload bay area. So uh, someone's headed out to check on that right now.
All right. Thanks everybody for uh, tuning into this Blue Shift Aerospace uh, live stream and FM broadcast of our launch of our uh, prototype sounding rocket, Stardust 1.0. This will mark Maine's first commercial rocket launch and the first commercial rocket launch powered by a bio-derived fuel uh, anywhere in the world. Uh, we probably have a, a minute or two, so I, I would uh, add to that larger... Uh, oh, stand by. Advised that launch is imminent. Okay. Lunch continues to be into uh, <laughs> imminent. Six, five, four, three, two, one. Ignition sequence start.
All right. Uh, this time it looks like we had oxidizer flow, uh, but the igniter didn't go. So uh, stand by.
All right, so uh, we confirmed uh, an issue with the main valve, pressure on the main valve. Uh, resolving that uh, situation is uh, fairly simple. However, we'll have to repressurize and reheat the oxidizer run tank. So at this time, uh, our new target for liftoff is uh, between 1 and 1.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, that is uh, between 90 minutes uh, to... Uh, Well, yeah. Roughly 90 minutes from now, maybe a little over. In the meantime, we have uh, a couple of interviews that we'll uh, be able to share, and I can also uh, take questions through the uh, live stream chat.
you're uh, just joining us, this is a Blue Shift Aerospace live stream for the launch of Stardust 1.0. This will be the State of Maine's first uh, commercial rocket launch and the first commercial launch. Commercial launch. Apologies. Uh, powered by a bio derived rocket fuel. Anywhere in the world. At this time, uh, we are refilling the oxidizer run tank aboard Stardust 1.0. Uh, once we uh, reach the appropriate fill level, then we start heating the tank as well to uh, pressurize it. And, uh, with the time that it will take to do that, we are now targeting 1 to 1.30 p.m. Uh, Eastern Time for launch. So uh, this is a good time to get up and stretch, <laughs> maybe uh, grab a, a, a drink and a snack, something like that. In the meantime, happy to answer uh, questions in the live chat. And we also have some interviews. to. Uh, kind of tied things over. So we're going to uh, pull up an, an interview here with Blue Shift founder and CEO, Sasha Derry, and uh, learn a little more about his story. Sasha Derry, founder and CEO of Blue Shift Aerospace. No E in the blue. <laughs> like every great high adventure science fiction story, uh, this one began on a farm. Yeah, so, um, gosh, I think it was, I think it was 2013. I was doing some uh, engine tests, small engines, very small engines. Uh, test with uh, a good friend of mine and a college mate from University of Southern Maine, engineering college mate. And uh, we just sat down in my brother's kitchen. My, my brother was an organic farmer at the time. And I sat down, I was looking out his windowsill and just happened to see this substance on his windowsill. And uh, I wondered, wow, I wonder if this particular substance would work better than the petroleum derived fuel that we've been trying out this whole time. And I said, well, it would just be, it would just be a wonderful, it would be wonderful if for, you know, uh, the tra trajectory of a rocket company, if we could choose a fuel that was at least close to the performance of petroleum based fuel and geez, you know, had right off of a farm. So anyways, two weeks went by, we, we spun up a, a fuel grain and tested it and immediately it was it not only performed as good it performed better than the petroleum derived uh, standard substance that we were using in our hybrid engines uh, so we we were delighted it was a wonderful turn of events and i think you know so much in history happens that way where it's just accident you sit down it wasn't exactly peanut butter mixing into chocolate but uh, uh, you could technically eat our fuel uh, wouldn't recommend it uh, and nothing bad would happen to you totally non-toxic. And as far as I know, we are the first company uh, in the world to commercially launch a rocket using a bio-derived fuel. Yeah, it, it wasn't always called Blue Shift though, right? It, it, uh, it had another, it had a working title for a little while. Right, so uh, in the beginning when we started with a group of interested individuals, it was, um, I formed a meetup group called Space Flight Innovators. And from that, um, the essence of those people, not all ground up, but the essence of, <laughs> the essence of those who are really What's dedicated. What's in our bio-derived fuel, <laughs> Sasha? <laughs> Soylent green. <Yeah>. Um, <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, 
It is renewable though. But no, it's uh, it was uh, from from the sort of the core of those people who were really dedicated and working hard. We formed Blue Shift Aerospace. I knew when I formed that group uh, that what I wanted to do. I didn't know the name of the company that I wanted, uh, but I knew what we were up to, and I wanted to find out who who. Um, when we get a group of people together, there's the people who are passionate for a day. There's a group that are passionate for a week, month. And then there's a very small few that are passionate for years. And that's that's the type of persistence that gets you to, well, for lucky, to a launch. And hopefully more yeah. than one. You, you had to uh, kind of find your, make your fortune elsewhere. Yeah. But always wanted to return. Yeah, so I grew up in Maine, uh, love Maine, was trying for two decades to get back to Maine. And um, I started Blue Shift in Massachusetts and uh, with the, the group of people of the, from the meetup folks. And um, we finally got to the point where we needed to do these engine tests with this new fuel, larger engines, uh, some interesting nozzles. And we started looking around. We looked around at uh, local towns, uh, sand pits, anywhere where we could, you know, safely do tests. Nobody <laughs> wanted us to do rocket engine tests. Looked around for funding, no place. You know, in Massachusetts, it was biotech, pharmaceuticals, that's your place. Literally had people telling me, if you want to do aerospace, go to Florida, go to Texas, go to California. But then I had one person, uh, actually from the state of Massachusetts, say, you know, check out the state of Maine. They have some interesting programs there that fund uh, innovative research or in development of new new companies and tech. And I think they are also welcoming to aerospace companies. And so they were right. I found Maine about the Maine Technology Institute. I found out about a place, an incubator called uh, Tech Place, which is built on the former Brunswick Naval Air Station uh, that is dedicated, uh, you know, they're, they're vision is to develop not only biomedical uh, companies and um, agricultural companies, but specifically aerospace companies. And this is a place that not only has, you know, um, facilities for office area on conferences, but they have machine shop, they have a composites room, a composite, a gigantic composites oven. Uh, and now we're a num one of a number of aerospace companies that call that, that place home to us. But most importantly, they welcomed us doing rocket engine tests there, uh, which blew my mind. I was, I was, you know, I was tickled pink with the fact that not only was, uh, did we find a place to actually test our engines, but we found a place that we call home, uh, where I called home, Maine, uh, welcoming us to, um, back to Maine. We did, an, uh, we did, I think over 170 engine, test with different uh, biofuels sort of mixed together, uh, including that original one, until we found sort of our optimal formulation that was only, you know, turned out being a, just a little bit better than our original, the original uh, formula that we used in the way back in the beginning. So uh, what was it like to get that NASA grant? Yeah, so that wasn't the first time we tried to get it. So when we actually got one, we were ecstatic. Uh, and. Uh, um, I think within about a, oh, I was going to say a week, but I think within one day, I went from ecstatic to, oh, no, <laughs> we've got to deliver and we don't want to mess this up. Uh, so it was, um, it was really great. It gave us, uh, it gave us a lot of credibility. It gave us, um, it, it, it treated a lot of people in the potential investment community, uh, it would treat us more seriously once we'd gotten that grant. I think the public in Maine, especially, started taking it more seriously that, hey, this rocket company really is up to something here in Maine. Mm -hmm. And then ultimately, you know, you know, doing, working through the grant to develop our, our sort of more, our, now what's our stable version of our hybrid rocket engine that uses a bio-derived fuel. Um, that was a really difficult time. Uh, it was really hard and everybody's pushing themselves really hard. Um, and uh, incredibly, the team really uh, did an excellent job in the end. And we hit all of our milestones 
that we'd set out for ourselves within that NASA grant. And really that what we had done there, you know, we, we had spent three to four years just developing the, the sort of the, the secret formula to the biodrive fuel, optimizing it. And then that um, it was almost a year long activity, even though it was really six months, we were working three months ahead of time and working a month afterwards, you know, doing more development work. It was really that year of NASA grant time that we honed in our engine and became, and it became, it, we realized it became time to launch it. Um, it was time to get some customers, launch the rocket. But what's amazing is that we took from 2014 till 2019, so what was that five years yeah. uh, to develop the biofuel, the engine. That was a lot of time, a lot of work, a lot of tests. All, over the course of all those tests, including NASA tests, was over well over 200 rocket engine tests. But we we developed Stardust, the fuselage, the composite fuselage, the avionics, um, the control systems, the communication system, everything. We did all that and just built it, tested it uh, in nine months. And um, you know, are there things we want to do differently? Yes, and and we were planning to do those in Stardust 2.0. We're already thinking ahead of where we want to, what we want to do, where we want to go, how we want to build it, how things are going to change, and that is part of the reason for doing Stardust 1.0. The the mission of Stardust 1.0 is you know the safe operation of the vehicle, safe launch and recovery of payloads, um, but also to to raise awareness uh, of what we're doing um, with investors, right? Yep. Yeah, uh, you know, what we were hearing from the uh, investment community that was knowledgeable of aerospace is that there's over 100 companies, probably over 140 companies uh, developing rockets, but they're all in the stage that we were in uh, from 2014 to 2019, developing the rocket engine, but not making, not getting to the point where they're building a, truly building a business. Uh, and it's hard. And so what they told us is that we don't care if you launch the rocket a mile up, and that's what we're doing. <laughs> but we want to see you take that engine, launch it, build the whole rocket, importantly, get customers and show us that there's interest in what you're doing, in your business model, and people are willing to pay for it. And then ideally, launch those customer payloads, bring it back down, yeah, and and give it back to your customers. So that's exactly what we're doing. And, and if things go really well, uh, uh, that's what we'll, everybody will see on Sunday. If someone was interested um, in, you know, maybe uh, contacting you and, and uh, learning more about, you know, what it, what it would be to, to invest in Blue Shift, um, what would be like the, the best way to do that? We, we literally just posted on our website the ability for folks to um, to send us a message if they're interested in investing in us. They can put their name, their email in there, and we'll reach out and contact them. So if you if folks are watching this on YouTube, if they look on the description of the um, of the stream, recorded stream, there should be a link um, to a page on our website for folks to just send their name and email address if they're interested what? in investing. Who did that? <laughs> <laughs> so I think it might have been you, man. <laughs> Just saying. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah, if, if folks are interested, please you know, please send out your your name and uh, your email address, and we'll reach back out to you. Uh, we might have some uh, different opportunities for how um, how we'll open ourselves up to investment here shortly. You know, I, I, say I should I should clarify. You know, to, to a large degree, we've already received investment um, by our team members, uh, by myself, of course, um, by MTI. Oh well, when you put it that way, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, that's what that's what's gotten us here. It's it's the yeah. investment in the blood, sweat, equity that so you know the bulk of the folks that have worked on this over the years. It's been blood, sweat, equity. So we we are in the point where we're ready we're ready to we want to move very quickly to full commercialization. So we're uh, we're we're in the stage where we're seeking out angel investments. 
but we're also considering, um, we're investigating some other interesting avenues to, um, I guess, thanks to some thanks to some changes in federal laws in the last couple of years. Uh, there, there is the ability for crowdsourced investment funding. Um, and uh, we think we have a really compelling business and really compelling um, mission uh, that we, and uh, frankly, compelling future profits that we believe that we might be able to widen the scoop of people that might be interested in investing us down the road. So stay tuned. Hope to have more information on that soon. Yeah, because a lot of uh, a lot of big investors, if if you'll, I'm pretty sure that's not a you know a trade term, but um, this question seems to keep coming up of like, oh, when are when are you selling? Mm. Yeah, so um, that is often <laughs> often the case. I think one thing that we are, how whatever direction this company goes to, uh, we are really interested in, in developing. Uh, this company in Maine, uh, manufacturing the rockets in Maine, um, and uh, developing um, um, being an important part of the spaceport, the, the future Maine spaceport that's underway mm -hmm. here in Maine. Uh, and we want to see that continue in the future. We want to see Blue Shift be uh, become uh, an important player in the nano satellite and suborbital launch market for customers, not only in Maine, of course, but across the world and across the globe. In fact, uh, just uh, just a week ago, I was talking to an um, uh, interested customer from South Africa that has a number of educational experiments that they would like to send up. Uh, so even, even when we didn't have an opportunity to uh, launch, uh, we're finding there's a lot of interest in the type of business we're going after. And it's, it's important for us that, that, that our success of our company uh, is grown in the fertile soils of, of Maine. It doesn't mean we don't grow beyond the state of Maine down the road, but that it's headquarters and, and stays here. Well, another thing that really sets Blue Shift apart is uh, we plan to offer um, suborbital launch, not as a stepping stone to orbital launch, but eventually we, we plan to offer both services. That's right. Yeah. Uh, both services will be offered with up to 30 kilograms of payload. And uh, we will ultimately be launching off the coast of Maine. And importantly, you know, Maine offers that incredible advantage, that geographical advantage you can't get anywhere on the eastern seaboard of being able to send the satellites into what's called a polar orbit. So we can shoot it directly towards the south, south pole, then loops around north, south, north, south. And it, it turns out um, in the market for sending tiny CubeSats or nano satellites to space, uh, just over half of them want to go into that particular orbit. And then the other half uh, may have particular orbits that they want to get into, but there's a significant portion of those which don't care what orbit they're in and we can take advantage of that. But the key is there's nowhere else on the Eastern seaboard where you can launch into a polar orbit and not go for people and property. Uh, you have you can do that on the west west coast with Vandenberg, a military base is very expensive, operationally difficult, um, or in, in Alaska, uh, which is also logistically very expensive. I'm sure beautiful, um, but also uh, very expensive. And then I, I think that we are, Maine has the other, uh, I'd say more stereotypical advantage. Uh, we're known as vacation land, right? Uh, so when our customers and many customers do, many customers who are sending up their first payloads, especially if they're research customers, they accompany their payloads and they wanna to go to a place that's beautiful, inherently enjoyable to be at. M Maine is one of the, I'm completely biased, but one of the more beautiful states to visit. So we think we, think, we, think we have a real advantage, not only from what we're offering as a service, but but from the fundamental fact that we can do this from the state of Maine with an advantage. Yeah. Yeah. And even, um, you know, do, doing this uh, first launch from Loring, um, you know, we're, there's, there's this wonderful hotel, the bunker in right here on, on the base. There's a, a hardware store, maybe 15 minutes away. Yeah. I, I've got to say uh, Loring itself, the limestone area yeah. has been incredibly welcoming to us. They've been incredibly welcoming to 
Uh, there's other aerospace companies. There are already, without going through all of them, there are actually other aerospace companies here present on campus. Um, just like Brunswick Landing, uh, where the former Naval Air Station was, they have welcomed us with open arms um, and literally plowed the runway for us to go yeah. ahead and launch. Uh, they want to see more aerospace companies come here. It's a great place for doing experiments. Um, I don't want to say it's the wild, wild west, but you, there's a whole bunch of liberty and freedom you get up being up in northern Maine. That's hard to get anywhere else, uh, anywhere else in the eastern seaboard. You might have to go to Montana or Wyoming to get the, the sort of li you know liberty and freedom you can to operate your business. And I know there, you know, there's a real opportunity, especially for horizontal launch vehicles from mm -hmm. here in line. Have you, did you notice that on uh, our hotel? Yeah, yeah. I know, you, I know you noticed, but I have to comment at our hotel, at the Bunker Inn, I have no idea how long that sign's been there, but there are two rockets <laughs> launching off yeah, the yeah. sign. I mean, it was, it, was, it was destiny that we stayed at that hotel for our first launch. Yeah, there was, there was a lot of there was a lot of signs, uh, and and not just the the scale model of the solar system uh, that we drove past getting here. I mean, there was yes, that's right on the way over. We we get off the highway in Holton, and there's what that motel, right? Yes, yeah, Stardust Motel. <laughs> yeah, on the way here. <laughs> I swear we didn't name it after them. Well, Sasha, I know you're a, a busy guy, so I don't want to keep you for for too terribly long. Um, any uh, any parting thoughts for our viewers? Yeah, I, you know, I think it's, what we're doing here is special. Uh, you know, yes, we're hitting a number of first, first commercial rocket launch in Maine, first commercial rocket uh, launch using a bio drive fuel. Um, but I think, you know, I'm, I'm speaking to the media audience when I say this, but I think it's time for us to reconsider what Maine is capable of and what Mainers are capable of. Uh, there's a bit of Yankee ingenuity. Uh, there's a bit of, um, I think, persistence, especially when you see our guys and us out there in mm -hmm. single digit weather doing what we're doing. Uh, I think there might have been a particular, uh, a particular um, space agency that said this, this is no Boca Chica. <laughs> I got to tell you, this is no Boca Chica either. It's not a Cape Canaveral. Uh, the temperatures are a bit lower. Um, but I think, you know, and we've been doing that for years. It, we persistence is in our blood. This is what we do. Um, just because it's hard doesn't mean we don't do it. And uh, I hope this, this is a good demonstration of the innovation that is already occurring here in the state of Maine and will continue to, to occur. And I hope it's, uh, I hope we see it blossom out to uh, Maine becoming a significant player in the space industry from all, all levels. Here, here. Yeah. Well, thanks again, Sasha. Thanks, Seth. Um, yeah. Sasha Derry, founder and CEO of Blue Shift Airspace. Uh, thanks again for, uh, for taking the time. Thank you very much, Seth. Yeah, we're really excited. Uh, we're, we're excited to make history for both uh, the state of Maine and for Blue Shift. Sasha Derry, founder and CEO of Blue Shift Aerospace. No E in the blue. <laughs> like every great high adventure science fiction story, uh, this one began on a farm. Yeah, so... Um,
and thank you so much for uh, staying with us on this Blue Shift Aerospace live stream and FM transmission as we uh, make history with Maine's first commercial rocket launch and the first commercial rocket launch in the world powered by a bio-derived fuel. Uh, right now we are holding as we repressurize and reheat the oxidizer tanks. We've had two uh, launch attempts today so far. Uh, on one of them the uh, igniter didn't go and on one of them the main engine didn't go. But uh, we will get there. So a little bit of welcome downtime. I love uh, seeing the conversation about the, the Doppler effect in the, uh, in the comments. Uh, Galaxy YT asks, uh, is it a scrub? Uh, no, at this point we are holding and plan to attempt a launch between 1 and 1.30 p.m. Eastern Standard. So uh, if you're in our time zone, this is a good opportunity to grab lunch. question. Can the rocket uh, be reused after recovery? Well, the technical answer is it depends on the landing. But yes, uh, Stardust 1.0 is designed to be fully reusable, uh, with the exception of those little metal kind of tines, that structure that you can see on the base of the rocket. Here we have a good view and you can see just below the fin can those uh, metal structures. They serve a couple purposes. Uh, one of them is to keep the nozzle away from uh, whatever it touches. So on landing uh, that could be brush. Um, there are a number of systems in place to, you know, if, first of all cool the nozzle um, and then second of all uh, those those metal structures will you know just keep brush clear of the uh, of the hotter components. But also uh, those tines can absorb a little bit of the force of impact in uh, what is called a litho breaking maneuver. Stardust uh, will bleed off most of its uh, speed using a parachute. Um, but that last little bit, um, some of that will be absorbed by the tines. And so that little part will be replaced. Um, but other than that, Stardust 1.0 is fully reusable. As we scale up, the plan is to, uh, to have all of our rockets be reusable. Uh, will they be descending by parachute or using other means? Uh, I can't say too, too much at this point. But uh, yes, we're definitely looking at reusability.
NASA space flight bringing the star power. My goodness. And quite right, that is uh, quite, quite a tower. Uh, it's about uh, 72 feet above the ground. For this uh, prototype rocket where we're demonstrating the fuel in flight, which by the way, NASA space flight, uh, we've put the question out a couple of times. Maybe, uh, maybe someone over there can advise when is the last time that um, a new rocket fuel was invented? Because we think it was uh, 2014, and we can't we can't tell exactly how long before that, but we think it was a while. So the reason that the uh, the tower is perhaps a little uh, taller than, than usual for a rocket of this type is because we took the uh, the test engine and put it in the rocket. So uh, there's steel in the rocket. All right, uh, just touching base with uh, one of the engineers back now. Uh, long story short, because uh, Stardust 1.0 is a little heavier than uh, other rockets of its class, it takes a little longer to get up to headway speed. So the tower is a little bit uh, taller than average. Matei Toth uh, asks, uh, is the rocket orbital or suborbital? It is, uh, it is very suborbital. Uh, we're only going to 5,200 feet above sea level, and the rocket will be subsonic uh, throughout the flight. The main purpose of this mission is to demonstrate our, uh, our hybrid rocket engine, the modular adaptable rocket engine for vehicle launch, or MARVEL, and our proprietary uh, bio-derived solid fuel uh, in flight. Steve Dosh, thank you for the weather report. Appreciate that.
Javier Olguin uh, asks if NASA Spaceflight has an article up about Stardust that you can read while we wait. Um, I will link to our uh, kind of spec page on Stardust on our website here in just a moment. And uh, NASA Spaceflight, uh, feel feel free to uh, you know let's let's set something up. Let's have our people talk to your people. Rogue Space, thanks for joining us. We would uh, we would absolutely love to launch Orbots. Looking forward to uh, chatting after our first launch. Matthew Becker asks uh, about throttling ability. The uh, uh, a hybrid engine can throttle by controlling the flow of oxidizer through the reaction chamber. And in fact, uh, part of our flight, you will see a throttle down uh, as Stardust burns through uh, excess uh, fuel on board. Jorge Arrington, or George Arrington, asks, uh, are there plans for a bio-derived liquid fuel? Uh, not, not here at Blue Shift, but there are several companies working on a bio-derived uh, liquid-fueled rocket. So we are, uh, we're not alone in this space. Flutter Tree asks, do you plan on bringing on more people uh, pending the results of the test? Absolutely. It's our stated goal to create 40 aerospace jobs uh, here in the state of Maine over the next five years. And uh, we're also staunch supporters of the uh, of Spaceport Maine. Uh, not only because launching from Maine is integral to our business model, but also because the spaceport will create even more jobs here in the state. Mm -hmm. 
Swiffer Enterprise asks, do you need FAA approval for this flight? Why, yes, we do. Uh, there are actually two points in our countdown where we call into the FAA. Uh, one to announce uh, two hours advance and then one to announce launch imminent. Amari Jaquad asks, is the launch tower at a fixed location or on a sort of trailer? Well, it's uh, definitely on a sort of trailer. And uh, let me tell you, uh, after a lifetime of experiencing launch pads traveling around at a top speed of three miles an hour, uh, it really is something to see this thing in, uh, in its travel configuration uh, passing vehicles on the highway. Hashtag sort of trailer. Yes, let's start that, Sam. I like it. Christian Bradley Hubs asks if the suborbital launch area will be luring for future launches too, and will orbital launch uh, be on the coast south of Brunswick? So, the plan for Spaceport Maine uh, is evolving, but as things stand, uh, mission control, uh, business incubator, uh, launch integration, and educational uh, outreach that's all going to be coordinated out of brunswick it'll be kind of like the the houston of our space program uh, loring uh, can do suborbital um, vertical launch uh, for for our amateur rocketry um, and uh, something bigger could be in the works but uh, the real assets here are the runway, which would be terrific for horizontal launch. Uh, something like what uh, Virgin Galactic and Virgin Orbital are doing, or Maine's own Vault Enterprises. Uh, could make good use of this of this runway. Uh, there are also some terrific facilities up here that could be very easily repurposed for uh, some modern. 
uh, R and D. So this could be kind of like the uh, Edwards Air Force Base, maybe of uh, of main space program. And last but not least, if you're going to launch to orbit, you really need ocean overflight. It's the safest way. And launching off of uh, Maine's coast, you can go due south or a little bit off south to a sun synchronous orbit, or any special case of a near polar orbit, really, um, safely with about 1,800 miles of ocean overflight. So we would love to see a down east launch site uh, built for that purpose. Now that would uh, probably not be south of Brunswick, that would probably be on the coast in Washington County. So uh, out of staters that would be uh, somewhere between Bar Harbor and Eastport. Chicken Takeover, love the name, asks, would you plan on making any bigger rockets than Red Dwarf, or would you just make that the biggest? That's a really good question. So at the end of the day, our design architecture is based around a single type of engine, the modular adaptable rocket engine for vehicle launch, Marvel. And uh, this rocket, um, is it or this this engine is going to uh, be able to optimize itself for uh, whatever altitude uh, it's operating at so as a result uh, we won't need different uh, nozzles for the different stages and so to build a custom rocket for a custom mission uh, you just need to plug some parameters into some software and get out a recommended series of clusters and stages of marvels. So, could we go bigger than Red Dwarf? Theoretically, yes. Uh, all depends on what makes the most sense for a mission. With that said, we really plan to focus on 30 kilogram payloads and for the near future at least, uh, sending those to low Earth orbit. S. Riley done. No comment.
I've seen a couple of folks uh, asking when we plan to launch to orbit. And our first flight of Red Dwarf uh, currently is planned for 2024. Our drone UI asks, uh, Seth, hey, can you please add live telemetry when launching? Uh, not for this flight, sorry, um, but it is very much in the works for future flights. Robin Cornelly asks, uh, do you work with partners, or do you work together with NASA or other international partners? Well, we developed the hybrid engine under a NASA SBIR grant. Um, but at this time, I, I wouldn't say that we have any formal collaborations, no. Uh, Maria Kotujan asks, uh, will the rocket return to Earth? Oh, definitely. Yes. Um, uh, Stardust 1.0 will des descend by parachute. Um, it'll separate, uh, actually kind of like uh, a lot of model rockets do. The uh, payload section and the uh, engine will descend uh, tethered together kind of by way of the main parachute. Uh, all of our launches will be suborbital, so they will come uh, back down, uh, at least until 2024 when we begin uh, launching uh, to low Earth orbit with our three-stage rocket, the Red Dwarf. A couple of folks have uh, asked about using our bio-derived fuel in uh, land-based vehicles, uh, including the launch trailer. And all I can say there is that because it's a solid fuel, I, I would not imagine that. Perhaps... Uh, something like those takeoff assist uh, rockets that they used to get heavy aircraft off of uh, aircraft carriers, something like that. But uh, I don't think that you could burn our fuel or, or, or a version of it uh, in a gas tank.
Joaquin Eichhorn asks, uh, who else wants to see a collaboration uh, between Blue Shift Airspace and Leah Aerospace? Well, I'm not sure exactly how we would collaborate with Leah Aerospace, but it was really cool to see their launch last week, or sorry, earlier this week. And uh, I did get to reach out to their CEO, Dan Ettenberg, to congratulate the team on the launch. And that was really nice, getting to, uh, to meet him. Kay Eberhardt asks, uh, how far downrange do you expect recovery? Uh, well, we've run simulations and uh, Stardust should touch down within one or two hundred feet of the launch tower. All right, well, uh, stand by here for uh, an update on the launch status.
All right, so the update from Mission Control here is uh, after our two launch attempts, we are going to need to refuel the igniter. Oxidizer is uh, filled, so the run tank is at pressure, but now we need to heat it up uh, in preparation for the launch. With that in mind, uh, we're looking at 2.30 to 3 p.m. Eastern Standard for uh, launch. And uh, it has also come to my attention that uh, we have been tweeted by Dr. Tanya Harrison and then retweeted by Scott Manley. And none of us can quite believe it. Now, given that uh, we've got a little bit more time here, I'll definitely uh, answer a couple more questions from the chat. But first, let's do another interview. In just a minute here, We'll do an interview with uh, Terry Shahata, Executive Director of the Maine Space Grant Consortium. And Terry will walk us through, uh, in a little bit greater depth, that vision of Spaceport Maine. And what's happening, uh, not just with Blue Shift, but with Maine's thriving if somewhat nascent uh, space economy.
Hi, Terry. Hey, hi, Seth. Uh, great to chat, and and uh, thank you so much for for being a part of this. Now, uh, Terry, you are the executive director of the Main Space Grant Consortium. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, pronounced consortium right. Right. <laughs> Good. So, uh, why don't you tell everybody just a little bit about you know what what is a space grant consortium? Um, the consortium is part of a uh, uh, national network of uh, 52 state-based consortia uh, funded by NASA. And that includes all 50 states plus uh, District of Columbia and Puerto Rico. Um, so we're funded totally by NASA and uh, out of NASA headquarters in Washington. And our mission in life really is, is really to uh, maintain the national intellectual capacity for research and education as it relates to aerospace to really serve the needs of NASA. Um, but at the same time, do it um, in a mutual way that also builds our respective states' aerospace-related research and education. Uh, so the funds that we get from NASA, and it varies uh, by the size of the consortium, um, the funds that we get, we we uh, it, it falls into different buckets, and uh, um, the first major bucket, really, uh, the first bucket is is is, is to support seed grants for both uh, uh, for faculty at our higher education institutions um, to really begin the process if they haven't done so to become more familiar with what NASA is about, and then to get themselves involved in research activities after they've completed their seed grant. Uh, I might add before I continue is that uh, all of our all of the consortia across the country um, are what we uh, term affiliate based, um, and and so here in Maine, um, our organization is really based. Although we have a, a board of directors because we're the only five hundred one c three organization in national network, uh, we also have affiliates, and I think we have about eighteen or twenty. Uh, many higher education, private, public institutions, um, um, community college, and, and businesses, and, and K through 12, and we work through them to build the state's infrastructure. Um, and as an affiliate, you're usually eligible for fun, competitive funds and sometimes targeted funds from us. Anyway, the this, this second uh, level of investment is uh, in higher education, uh, also um, in building. Uh, uh, supporting um, curriculum development or enhancing existing curriculum that add um, add uh, um, more information uh, in support of aerospace uh, for workforce development. Uh, so that supports undergraduate and graduate students as well. And uh, as part of the uh, higher education, um, we also support uh, programs like uh, uh, the, the scientific ballooning program at the University of Maine. Uh, that's really a, a state a state resource. It's not only for you at University of Maine. Um, then the uh, major other bucket is uh, uh, for internships, um, and there are really two level of internships: that's, uh, fellowships and internships. Um, fellowships really go to the higher education institutions, and they use those funds per our guidelines and requirements. Uh, to provide opportunities to both undergraduate and graduate students to do work in, in uh, NASA related areas um, that they're interested in. Um, uh, so we do that with several of our higher education affiliates. And then the second part of that program are internships. And uh, um, again, those are primarily for undergraduate students um, across the state that are part of our affiliate based. And um, they, uh, uh, those internships are really a play, uh, uh, place-based in the sense that it's really about, it's um, uh, close to, depending, seven to 10 weeks uh, in one of the 10 NASA centers across the country, uh, whether it's in California, JPL, or Ames, um, it could be at Goddard, um, in a, you know, it could be over to the Kennedy, uh, as well as Johnson. So it, it varies based on the interest of, of the student and the needs of the particular centers. We do have a separate program uh, for high school interns. Um, and this is a six week program, uh, pretty competitive, uh, where we place these, the students who are selected for six weeks uh, in, um, in a mentored environment, either in a higher education research lab or in a private lab uh, or a nonprofit lab. And uh, those are pretty uh, popular uh, because this is probably one of the first time 
that the high school students, and these are a rising junior um, and certainly seniors, um, but it's one of the first time that they're involved in actual doing research in, in a live environment. Right. And, and then the last the last kind of program that we have is uh, is more outreach, awareness of what NASA and the state is doing. And so we do a lot of outreach with K through 12 organizations. Uh, we support uh, 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 Space Day Maine in, uh, mm-hmm. in May every year and other things. Um, uh, no, no conversation would be complete without mentioning the spaceport. So uh, a lot of people will are, um, you know, in their day to day, they they don't just think about all of this uh, Cold War infrastructure that Maine has. And the yeah. fact that we've got this high latitude and yeah. south facing coastline and stuff. So, so we have all these natural advantages uh, yeah. that are just there. But even even so, there's a real boldness to saying, OK, we're going to build a spaceport here and we're going to become a regional or perhaps global leader in uh in the small launch you know small payloads of of nano satellites uh so how did how did that all start there was there was like a a meeting in 2017 right yeah 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 well, that's one of the yeah that was uh, the the first time that we kind of rolled the idea out i guess it was it uh, it started um probably three four years ago because uh you know, we've been investing uh, funds in building assets at the, at, you know, in, in Maine uh, for education and research, and uh, um, and um, and I, you know, and we've been we've been really addressing what NASA really wants. So we've been very successful from that perspective. But I was having a hard time uh, figuring out, um, even though uh, we are investing, and have been, and will continue to invest in in, in assets building. Uh, capacity here in the state. Um, they're not really well connected, um, per se, in terms of a higher vision. So um, I, I uh, came up with the idea uh, about a possible spaceport um, that's, n- that's more unique, it's different than the other spaceports, uh, the other uh, approved spaceports in the country, about 10 of them, I believe. Um, because of the, you know, the assets, geographic assets that we have, you know, we have Loring, uh, Loring Air Force Base or Loring Commerce Center now, um, and we certainly have Brunswick declining. So uh, the cost of doing something like this would be less prohibitive. Um, but what I was trying to look at to see is, is um, can we have from an economic and educational development or workforce development perspective, some higher vision that will unify and support the various uh, natural-based industries in the state that would that that are increasingly relying on data that, in, from space, from satellites, and things of that nature, and develop applications, and so on and so forth. Um, so, I kind of had that idea running in my mind, and I shared it with a couple of uh, board members, and that led to that meeting that you referenced. I think it was in March of 2017 and to say, hey, here's what we're thinking. And, um, you know, everybody was saying, you know, you hear the comments is that, no, really, Maine, are you kidding? And and then when we kind of lay out the facts and the potential, bold as it is, everybody kind of came around and they and they and they said is instead of saying, you know, really, Maine, they would say, why not Maine? Um, It is bold. Uh, It is very difficult to do. And I always hark back to a speech that President uh, Kennedy had made at, at Rice University in '62, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, um, where he challenged the nation for the first time, or pu- more publicly than before, to send man to the moon and return him safely. Um, but he war- and, and that and that was done because of national security purposes, you know, Sputnik and all of that stuff. But he challenged the nation. He said, "This is something that's really important." Be aware there's going to be major investment uh, with taxpayers' money, but the return on the investment is going to be significant, not only in terms of of getting someone to the moon uh, and back safely, but the underlying infrastructure in both research, education, and commercialization will really um, will be the tide that will will attempt to lift uh, many boats, and that in fact has happened. So that's kind of the principle and the philosophy and the approach that I, that I followed is that. If you develop the spaceport and develop it in a way that's integral and connected to the natural resource um, economy in the state, and oh, by the way, it would just create a new space economy, not to replace the others. Um, that's kind of the higher vision that I was looking for, that it, 
it, and, and space is so everybody likes space, but if they see that connection and, and, and how it, it really will help the other industries and provide educational opportunities for our students, keep our high school students here in the state in developing new businesses, attract new families, entrepreneurs, engineers, and scientists, and, you know, and everybody up and down the supply chain, the value chain. Um, that's what we're, what we're looking at. Uh, and that's why we decided to do the, uh, uh, the spaceport. I'm curious, Terry, what, what is it like to, to have this idea and to be kind of, you know, workshopping it and to slowly realize like, oh, this, this isn't crazy. We can do this. And now we, we almost have some sort of a, 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 an obligation to see this thing through. I mean, that's a, that must be like kind of exhilarating, but also a tremendous weight. Am I, am I barking up the right tree? Uh, no, that's the right tree to bark up to. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, it's one of those things you have to be careful what you wish for. Um, and I think we're in that stage right now. Uh, fortunately, we've uh, gotten a lot of support uh, from, uh, from different sectors in the state, um, certainly from the legislature. Um, as you were aware, Seth, when you, when you went to the, uh, um, to the hearings, uh, the, uh, the state's economic development um, committee and asked me approved the creation of the leadership council that was, was to develop the, the, uh, the, the strategic plan. And you and I were there. And then the following day, I think that was in March, the following day, the legislature locked down because of COVID-19. But fortunately, we were able to get uh, grants from uh, the Economic Development Administration out of the Department of Commerce um, and, and matching funds from, uh, from the Main Technology Institute to develop a strategic plan. And that's what we're doing right now. And what we hope to do is to, uh, I mean, our plan, our goal is to have some kind of a, a both investment strategic plan, list of par partnerships, anchor tenants and all that stuff, financials to um, and 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 what the expectations are from from the state government in terms of uh, co-funding some aspects of the construction of the spaceport uh, in partnership with the private sector. Uh, our goal is to do that by November, December of this year. So uh, there's a lot of yes, it's great to be there, but it's a big weight. It's really we can't fail. Um, we've gone so far. There's a lot of interest. Um, and, and the last thing I want to do is to really uh, uh, fall flat in our faces uh, when, when, when we have this kind of support. I mean, the window is very small, not only from a competitive basis uh, on a national scale, but also in terms of the momentum to, that we need to maintain in the interest of the spaceport for the good of the state. Well, we are really, really proud uh, to be breaking ground figuratively only, we hope. Um, no, I, absolutely. Um, you know, I, you know, it's, it's it's really we're really pleased. One of the things that was really important in the, in the selling, not only you know, showing what we have in terms of the infrastructure, mm -hmm. uh, onto landing as well as uh, lowering, and hopefully something in Washington County, whether it's a barge or something like that, is really having companies like Blue Shift on board. Uh, knowing that that there are such assets, an entrepreneurial company that's building the small rockets the kinds of rockets that the spaceport is intended to launch. Uh, knowing that we have one, at least Blue Shift and hopefully Vault will do the yeah. same thing, but we'll be able to attract, uh, that's not enough. I mean, we can't survive only on Blue Shift and uh, the spaceport uh, can't. Um, we have to, as you said earlier, um, is that we're not, we're looking at this to become uh, certainly a regional, uh, definitely a national and hopefully an international asset uh, so people can use a spaceport for uh, um, for launch, but also to attract the entrepreneurs and and uh, the skill sets that uh, and the workforce uh, to do research and development, commercialization, to develop applications as a result of uh, of the data that will be uh, um, that will be downloaded from the satellite, building the satellites, being innovative in different ways of of those CubeSats, engaging our students in some of that work, um, allowing all schools to have access to satellites where now it's very difficult. I mean, if you can imagine all of our uh, schools will, will have 24 seven access to satellite data um, and use it as they, as they want, you know, and get higher education involved. So, you know, in developing those applications for the marine industry, aquaculture, forestry, 
uh, not only for Maine, um, but also um, from an international scale. Um, and and uh, uh, so it, it's, it's really, the space force is intended to help Maine and Maine's economy, but by doing that, you make it into, you know, hopefully close to an international asset um, to generate the revenue and the skill sets that you need. One of my favorite things from being at, at the stakeholder meetings for the spaceport is yeah. realizing like, yeah, sure, we've got Blue Shift, we've got Vault. Uh, so that, that's two rocket companies, but there is so much more than that. I mean, the the the, the people, the, the IT experts that have shown an interest in participating because data storage and processing is a huge part of this. Um, getting to see, you know, the tech place and, and their business incubator and the innovation that they're already leading in, you know, the UMaine's Center for Undergraduate Research, USM's, a CubeSat fabrication facility yeah. that, that they yeah. just rolled out. Yeah. Um, you know, it's just, just all up and down, you know, vertically, horizontally <laughs> integrated. There, there is so much going on statewide in aerospace. We, we just, uh, it, it, it's almost like it's already happening. We just need a little, a little direction, a little, you know, nudge to, to yeah. get everyone going yeah. in the same direction. Yeah, that's a that's a good way of putting it. It's a, as, as we said, we we we've uh, and not not solely because of space grants investment, but because um, there are those companies and you know and and research programs that have been developed that are directly connected to aerospace and space um, research and technology development. Um, th that's that's been uh, uh, developing um, organically. Mm -hmm. And we kind of helped that along. Uh, the other things have happened. I mean, you guys came to Maine or returned to Maine, mm -hmm. um, not because of s space grant. You, you, you wanted to do something in the state. And there are a lot of companies that are involved that do that, too. Uh, we have a good supply chain. Um, it's not enough, though, but many of the suppliers, mm -hmm. companies, have been involved in space exploration and technology development. Um, uh, so it, it, it's just a question of saying uh, we have the semblance of the assets, both from research businesses and higher education, and certainly K through 12, putting those together in a very meaningful and strategic manner, and build upon that by attracting more from the outside. Uh, that's the key part because uh, we cannot rely on our eternal assets to make a spaceport successful. You know, we we really have to use that asset to attract others and build upon that for a successful spaceport. So the Spaceport Leadership Council, it now uh, exists and they're, they're putting together a report for the end of the year. Is that correct? That's correct, yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah. that's so, awesome. So, okay. so when that report comes out, how can, uh, how can people read it? Well, we're, we're, uh, we're going to make it public. We do have, we're, we're, we're going to do a series of public hearings around the state before we mm -hmm. finalize it. Um, we are um, early in the stage, but we're going to hopefully develop a, what we want to develop a website that will keep the public informed of the progress of this work. Um, and, uh, and, and then once we have the report finalized, that information will be uh, uploaded onto our website so the public can have access to it. So uh, we're not there yet, but it's something that we're trying to build. Well, thanks again, uh, Terry Shahada, Executive Director of the Main Space Grant Consortium, um, and uh, look forward to uh, continuing to to participate in in Spaceport Maine. Great, thank you very much, Seth. Thanks. Hi, Terry. Hey, hi, Seth. Uh, great to chat, and and uh, thank you so much for for being a part of this. Now, uh, Terry, you are the Executive Director of the Maine Space Grant Consortium. That's correct, yeah. yeah. And I pronounced consortium right. Right. <laughs> Good. So, uh,
Joining us, this is a Blue Shift Aerospace live stream of the Stardust 1.0 launch marking means uh, first commercial launch and the first commercial launch uh, powered by bio derived fuel in the world. interviews right now as we wait for the next uh, uh, liftoff here, launch attempt. I can answer a couple questions from the chat. Joshua Robinson, is the flight ceiling being nearly the height of Katahdin a coincidence? Yes, although it has not escaped us. We definitely love that fact a little bit too much. Initially Stardust was to fly to 4,000 feet above sea level. We got that increased to 5,200 feet uh, above sea level, um, and we were going to use that uh, increase in flight time to burn through more fuel. Yeah, sorry about the loop, guys. Uh, the uh, interviews here have been reconfigured, and so we should not have that issue on the next one.
All right, uh, we're going to go to another interview. Uh, Carl Flora, president of the Loring Development Authority. Uh, these are the guys that uh, paved the runway and taxiway that uh, you may be parked on if you're tuned in to 92.9. These are the guys that uh, gave us a, such a beautiful field office and, and are managing some just tremendous infra <laughs> excuse me infrastructure up here. And uh, we'll delve into that a little bit in this interview. So, Carl Flora, President and CEO of the Loring Development Authority and Loring Commerce Center. Thanks for uh, thanks for doing this. And uh, absolutely, yeah. So, and and by this, I mean uh, not not just facilitating the launch of Stardust 1.0, which the the Loring Development Authority has been just beyond amazing in you know helping us get the job done, um, but. But you've you've been uh, you've been with LDA for a while, right? Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I started late in 1995, about a little over a year after the the base actually closed. I've been there through just about everything, starting from the you know the very initial uh, effort to um, strike a deal with the federal government to acquire the property. Mm -hmm. um, through the acquisition process, which took several years, as you might imagine. Uh, <clears throat> and then uh, I've been involved in one way, shape or form or another um, ever since then in most of the, or all of the deals that we have struck with third parties uh, to utilize the property. Wow. Wow. And uh, gosh, it's, it's been, um... It's been really rough since the base closed. Population of Aroostook County uh, prior to Loring's closure mm -hmm. was, I believe, around 87,000. Okay. I could stand to be corrected on that. But in the decade that, that Loring closed, um, the, the difference between the 1990 census when Loring was open and not expected to close and the 2000 census was around 15,000, if I recall cor correctly. So we lost 15,000 out of about 85 or 87,000. Yeah. Wow. And uh, so the, the mission of the Loring Development Authority is to kind of revitalize the base and uh, kind of swords into plowshares, right? To, to repurpose um, the facilities on base for civilian use, commercial use mostly. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. And uh, so how, there, there have been uh, there have been some really interesting successes. And uh, so why don't I, you know, share some of those? Sure. <clears throat> well, at, at the outset, there were actually three federal programs that were identified for Loring. Mm -hmm. uh, one was the Defense Finance and Accounting Center. Um, oh yeah. Yeah. This and and that. Uh, that's that's been a, a big success for us in the sense that <clears throat> it, it it's our largest employer by a long shot um, employing close to 600 people um, and then there's a uh, u.s department of labor supported uh, job corps center uh, job corps uh, uh, has about anywhere from two to on the low side to as high as 400 on the high side uh, students, uh, most of whom live right there um, and complete a course of study. Uh, it's, it's generally for students between the ages of 16 and 24, and they'll leave with a, a, a certificate or a degree in, in uh, one, of the, one of the trades. Uh, so they, they have a, a number of programs there everything from the standard building trades <clears throat> to culinary arts, computer science, uh, and a, a, a number of others. So 
-hmm. you can get your CDL there, learn to drive a truck, uh, yeah. you know, all, all kinds of uh, uh, possibilities there. So they had been a long-term um, occupant of the lowering facilities as well. The third one was um, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, a big portion, probably the largest portion of the lowering acreage was actually designated as a uh, national wildlife refuge called a rustic wildlife Ref refuge. And uh, so the U.S. Fish and Wildlife uh, Service uh, manages that, uh, that property. That's mostly undeveloped property that would have been, you know, wooded buffer area uh, time that the Air Force occupied Loring. So, yeah. so we were talking about successes. One of one of the successes that sticks out in my mind is that <clears throat> after having gone through the BRAC process in uh, the 1990s, uh, which resulted in Loring's closure, um, the DFAS center that I alluded to um, was proposed for closure in 2005 uh, as part of that BRAC round. Um, we we fought it. Uh, we, f we felt as though it was a kind of a double brack um, in the sense that we'd already been <laughs> closed once before. Um, but the, uh, the, at the end of the day, uh, DFAS was trying to consolidate a bunch of smaller centers into three mega centers uh, nationwide, but we had a pretty strong argument that they should keep us open as a center, of, a smaller center of excellence because the uh, uh, the, the work that was being performed by the by the employees at the DFES Center here in Limestone uh, mm -hmm. was top notch. Uh, the the place sold itself. It was one of the cheapest operating locations that they had, and and the quality of the product coming out the other end was uh, beyond reproach. Wow, wow! So you were able to. I I didn't realize that that DFES was under consideration for. Yeah, it was, wow. it was, yeah, it was uh, recommended for closure by the, by the uh, Department of Defense, uh, but the BRAC process reversed that and actually increased the size of the center. So, wow. Yes, yeah, so that was a, that was a good, uh, well done development for us. So. Wow. And, uh, and so looking forward. Uh, I, I'm sure that there are plenty of things on the drawing board, not not just the spaceport. Uh, what are what are some of the things that you're working on moving forward? Well, there's there's a lot of different things. Uh, one of the things that that we did particularly well <clears throat> was um, you'll recall Maine Military Authority, the refurbishment of the military vehicles and equipment. Mm -hmm. um, Humvees, where people stop, would see Humvees going up and down the road all the time. Um, so we had, at one point in time, Maine Military Authority was our largest tenant in terms of facilities occupied. They they occupied nearly a half a million square feet of industrial buildings uh, and employed over 500 people. Um, so uh, the, from that, um, they've, over the years, uh, lost, lost ground. The, you know, the military work began to dry up somewhat. Uh, they tried to make a switch into the civilian world and, and uh, that did not meet with uh, as much success. Um, and so Maine military over its, uh, its uh, lifetime from starting in 1997 and ending in 2018, 21 years, went from zero to over 500 and back to zero. So, but we, we always felt as though we had the, the skills in the workforce uh, to, uh, to try to rebuild some of that. So those are the kind of things we're, we're gonna try to look at uh, manufacturing opportunities uh, all, of all types, anything from, uh, uh, you know, construction of um, uh, uh, vehicles, um, housing structures, um, there's um, uh, and, and some advanced manufacturing uh, using composite materials and, and other space age things. We'll we'll be looking at all those opportunities, and uh, we've we've got a line on a few of them. So now, um, 
the main military authority, um, uh, the spaces that they used to occupy, is that is that mostly uh, taken up by Loring Industries? Loring Industries occupies a couple of the um, facilities that were formerly occupied by main military. Yep. Got it. Yep. Okay. And also looking at the spaceport, um, I think you told me, we had a phone call a couple weeks back where, where you mentioned that uh, there, there's really no reason that a 737 couldn't land like you know god forbid there's like an emergency landing situation or something right that that the main runway at loring is uh you know good to go use usable and that maybe yes. a little bit of refurbishment just like some of the hangars might really be all that it uh all that it takes to start getting um you know something like something like pegasus or, or virgin orbital uh you know um or or vault enterprises right because they want to launch uh underslung from like a 737 or similar right and so yes uh, we could even have in-state companies operating that way out of Loring uh, pretty quickly. Yeah, yeah. I think Loring's um, the the most obvious role in in terms of space launching, um, uh, launching of spacecraft is is probably the what they refer to as a horizontal launch, mm. which is as you suggested a um, rocket that is mounted under the wing of an aircraft that takes it up to a, a fairly high altitude and and gives it a good head start on uh, getting into orbit. Yeah, yeah, that would be really terrific to see. And um, and there's there's a lot of other stuff across the the base, right? I mean, um, uh, you're you're sitting on some some fiber optic cable. That must have been uh, some some pretty forward facing technology when that when that line got laid down, right? Uh, well, there was this. I'm sure there was a lot of fiber um, in place when the Air Force left. I'm sure some of that probably is being used uh, to support uh, the, the functions at the Defense Finance and Accounting Center. Uh, <clears throat> but yeah, we've we have um, we've had um, a data center at Loring um, that was, uh, is, as I understand it, uh, handled a, a tremendous amount of, of data coming in and going out. Uh, so the uh, fiber network that would have been needed to support that had to be you know, pretty robust. And in addition, we have uh, the a, a portion of the so-called three-ring binder uh, fiber mm -hmm. network that was installed back in the late um, 2000s. So what what is the three three-ring binder? Because I've, I've heard that uh, bandied about a couple of times. Well, I'm, I'm certainly no expert, but at the time it was, uh, if you recall, the financial meltdown and, and yeah. there was uh, a, a lot of effort to identify shovel-ready projects that could be, um, you know, utilized to rebuild infrastructure. And so at that point in time, there was a group here in Maine that um, was very forward-thinking in terms of building out the fiber uh, system uh, and connecting uh, different parts of the state. Um, and so the, uh, the idea at the time was to put a, uh, a fiber network in place. Um, as it happens, uh, they decided to run uh, a section of it right through Loring. Um, and uh, so we have access to that, uh, that fiber uh, system. Uh, at the time, it was intended to be open access fiber, uh, meaning anybody who had the equipment and a and the wherewithal could, um, you know, uh, light a strand. It would be, you know, what people refer to as dark fiber. Yeah. Uh, so, <clears throat> um, so that uh, that infrastructure is in place and able to be used uh, here at Loring. Wow, and um, data data storage is uh, kind of one of the. Uh, un, unsung heroes of a really vertically integrated uh, kind of spaceport experience, right? That um, you 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 need. I mean, launching the satellite is all all well and good, and maybe that's the fun part that people show up to watch. Uh, but you know, once it's up there, you need to, you need to be able to talk to the satellite or at least listen to it, and then you need to put all that information somewhere safe and and be able to you know process it, analyze it, uh, run transformations, that sort of thing, and. Um, and so uh, limestone could be a huge part of that as well and kind of turning the, the spaceport main into a, a really vertically integrated one-stop shop, right? Yeah. Well, I do believe that the uh, data center that I mentioned has, you know, the, the potential to be developed along those lines, no doubt. Oh. 
And uh, when I was up there last time, I I, uh, I managed to like sc- scrounge up a little bit of, of, of free time, and I, I got to go uh, check out the uh, the engine testing facility, and that that was an experience. I I don't think I've ever seen a door so thick, but um, I I mean that um, I I just just walking in there, you could you could just like uh, I don't know, you could you could see the potential of the place. Yes. Yeah. Um, imagine the the engines that they must have tested now it, it did it did it see all that much uh use before the base closed i heard it was you know it was a fairly new building at the time yeah i my understanding is that the air force built um a fair number of those uh test cells um hmm. uh, at, at different air force bases um perhaps in the 1980s uh so i i i think you're right it it was probably built may have been, you know seen some use but not a whole lot of use before they decided that uh, it was time to close down are you on the the leadership council well i participated in the main space grant consortium um mm-hmm. up until now um i have uh sort of retired uh, <laughs> so i'm kind of in in limbo where where i'm mm-hmm. i've uh, announced my retirement and uh, but I'm still doing a little work on the side. So um, the extent of my future involvement is in question, uh, but I, it is certainly something that I would like to see move forward and uh, something that uh, that I, I support. Uh, I think it's a great opportunity for the state. Um, the the Maine, Maine can really play a, a significant role in the emerging uh, space uh, industry, um, and uh, as you know, there's there's a lot of facets that that go well beyond just the the launching and the you know the spaceport. What you think of as spaceport activities, um, <clears throat> there's the whole side of you know storing and managing the data that's collected from satellites. There's the whole communications side, that, you know, potential for um, cell phone and, and broadband or satellite based uh, uh, communications, including broadband, internet. Um, I mean, yeah. the sky's the limit. Um, and then there's the, the, you know, the whole side of once you collect data that you've uh, picked up with some kind of sensor, um, what do you do with that data? Uh, it's got there, people have to uh, go through it, analyze it, figure out what it means, catalog it. There's, uh, there, there's just a, a whole, I guess they would call it a value chain yep. uh, in, the, uh, in the space business. Love that phrase, yep. <laughs> so um, a, a huge part of suborbital flight is, uh, I mean, yeah, sure, sounding rockets, um, but also balloons can play a part and also aircraft flying a parabolic uh, trajectory. So uh, we know you can fly aircraft out of that runway, which I believe was a backup runway for the space shuttle, right? So, I mean, it, it was, yes. and, uh, and, and, and balloons. Now there was a, there was a blimp that operated out of Loring for a time, right? So, so doing something uh, with, with another blimp or with balloons, that would also probably be a pretty, uh, pretty quick operation to, to, you know, kind of prepare for that, right? Yeah. Yeah, we've had several, um, uh, I guess you'd call them R&D type projects. And this one was a, uh, that you're referring to was an unmanned airship, mm-hmm. um, you know, kind of like the Goodyear blimp without a pilot, uh, <laughs> except, well, there is a pilot, but he's on the ground. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> uh, but in other respects, the, the, uh, the blimp uh, was being developed for military uh, uses uh, and security uses, um, if you think about it. Uh, a, an airship um, can remain aloft for a long period of time. It can essentially stay in one place and serve as persistent surveillance, um, or it can fly a predetermined route um, and uh, you know can can uh, surveil uh, the ground from you know an altitude of anywhere from let's say 500 feet up to 10,000 feet. Any other uh... Any other thoughts you might want someone uh, watching this to, to walk away with? Well, just that, uh, you know, we're, we're happy to be involved and, uh, with the, uh, the, 
development of the space industry in the state of Maine. I hope that we can play a, uh, a big part going forward. Um, and Loring is, you know, locationally challenged a little bit. You know, people look at northern Maine and, and they don't realize how far away it is from where they probably are <laughs> located. <laughs> But once you get here, there's a, there's a lot more than than most people realize, and oh, yeah. uh, a place like Loring has um, has a lot to offer, uh, and we've proved it before, and we can prove it again that it is possible to do business profitably uh, in a place like Northern Maine. Um, you just have to think a little bit outside the box. Well, we've got you covered there. <laughs> yeah, um, and. Uh, you know, it, it sounds like there are whisperings of uh, bringing back an air taxi or something. So maybe that'll help a little bit with the uh, with the propinquity issue there. And uh, yeah, absolutely. It, it's less than yeah. it's probably what about a half an hour ride on a business jet. Yeah, yeah, something or, like that. Yeah. Portland. <laughs> yeah, and uh, you know, sometimes you need a kind of a, a remote location, right? Like like this could. Uh, we could be looking at like the Edwards Air Force Base kind of of, of New England, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, I, I, I've got to just say like, thank you so much to, to you and, and to Neil, the, the, the property manager at LDA um, for the, for our beautiful field office and uh, you know, for maintaining the, the, the runway and, you know, clearing it of, of the drifting snow and the ice and everything. And, um, it's, uh, you know, it, it, of course we couldn't have done it without you guys, but, um, it's, uh, to, to, to be, you know, welcomed and, and supported in, in such a way has just really meant the world to us. Yeah. Well, that's good. We were, we're happy that you're happy. We, uh, and we certainly hope that, uh, this launch is successful and, uh, catapults you to the next level, uh, in, uh, the development of your business. Well, thanks, Carl. <laughs> well, Carl Flora, President and CEO of the Loring Development Authority and the Loring Commerce Center, thank you so much for uh, taking the time to, to talk with us today. You bet. My pleasure. So, Carl Flora, President and CEO of the Loring Development Authority and Loring Commerce Center, thanks for, uh, thanks for doing this. And, uh, absolutely. Yeah. So, and, and by this, I mean, uh, not, not just facilitating the launch of Stardust 
And uh, if you're just joining us, this is a Blue Shift Aerospace live stream of the launch of Stardust 1.0. This will be Maine's first commercial launch and the first commercial launch of a rocket powered by a bio-derived fuel in the world. You just uh, saw or listened to an interview with Carl Flora, President and CEO of the Loring Development Authority. Uh, that's who manages the Loring Commerce Center, formerly Loring Air Force Base. And that is uh, our launch site today. As folks are uh, noticing in the comments, uh, we are now looking at closer to 3 p.m. for a launch. There is a possibility that that figure does get uh, moved up just just a little bit. Um, oxidizer tank has been refilled, so now we're uh, at heating again. But uh, the oxidizer is uh, still warm from the first two launch attempts of the day, so heating may not take uh, quite as long this time. Normally, we budget an hour for that and we'll keep you posted on how that goes.
If you're just joining us, this is a Blue Shift Aerospace live stream of the launch of Stardust 1.0, our prototype sounding rocket. Now this will be Maine's first commercial launch, as well as the first commercial launch of a rocket powered by a bio-derived fuel uh, in the world. We have uh, three commercial payloads aboard. Uh, I went through them uh, before I'll do so again briefly. Uh, Falmouth High School uh, worked with the University of Maine and the University of Southern Maine to outfit their CubeSat prototype with a GoPro, X in a box uh, chips to collect flight data, including acceleration, pressure, temperature, and humidity. And the team was recently featured on uh, an excellent episode of Chasing Maine by Roger McCord of the Maine Monitor. Which, as time allows, we may show here with permission. Kellogg's Research Labs is testing the vibration dampening properties of nitinol, a shape memory of alloy, sorry, a shape memory alloy of nickel and titanium. Uh, in conditions of a rocket launch. And these guys are real veterans of aerospace. Uh, in 2019, uh, they supplied more than a hundred components for satellites that were launched. And uh, Rocket Insights out of Massachusetts is uh, filling their CubeSat enclosure with traditional Dutch wafer cookies called Stroop Waffles in homage to their Amsterdam-based parent company, Dept, as well as a sort of rock tumbler uh, filled with samples of tourmaline, uh, a gem for which Maine is quite famous. And they will uh, use the, uh, the vibration of launch to try and tumble the rocks.
And uh, as we stand by for the historic launch of Stardust 1.0, uh, a couple updates from Mission Control here. The uh, igniter, basically a smaller motor, uh, is refueled. And it's at pressure. The oxidizer run tank is uh, fully loaded and uh, we are now heating that tank within about 20 degrees of nominal now. And so with the normal amount of time that that procedure takes and time uh, for a couple extra system checks thrown in and the weather continuing to hold very fair the outlook is really good for uh, a launch right around 3 p.m. Bruce Haberlin Jr. asks, uh, if I were to drive to Brunswick to witness a blue shift launch in person, what is the closest public observation point without uh, violating the range? Does anyone know? Well, um, at, the, uh, at the blue shift uh, office uh, near Brunswick Landing, or the test site, uh, it is uh, by invitation only. Um, public engine tests were on the drawing board up until uh, COVID. And uh, as we begin to uh, recover, we, we can re revisit that. Now, uh, Blue Shift will never launch anything from Brunswick, although that runway could also be used for a uh, horizontal launch. Um, basically, you, you mount a, a rocket to uh, an aircraft usually something along the lines of a 737. Uh, and then from, from the executive airport there, it could be uh, flown out over the ocean for a, for a launch. For a vertical rocket launch, uh, Brunswick is just too populated to launch safely. So we, uh, we look forward to doing more static fire tests there. But for a launch, uh, you'll probably be able to find us either up here at Loring or as our rockets get a little larger, uh, down at the uh, the Down East Coastal Launch Site. Now I can't speak for uh, the folks that will be running these facilities once they become a spaceport, but I certainly would not be surprised if there was public viewing uh, both at Loring and at the Down East Launch Site. Chicken Takeover asks uh, if we can return the chair shot. Uh, be assured, sir, that uh, I am monitoring the mission control camera, and I'll bring that shot back up uh, just as soon as there's uh, someone in the chair. With the uh, cold, there's been a, a, a little bit of innovation since we got here, and uh, so we figured out how to control most of the rocket systems from uh, inside our, our vehicles.
Christian Bradley Hubs asks if some of the Blue Shift team previously were on a college sounding rocket team. Yes, Luke Sandin, our senior mechanical engineer, uh, was a part of Team Ursa out of the University of Maine, and they launched two rockets uh, over uh, at least his time there. FS Airsoft UK asks, are you going to build bigger rockets after Red Dwarf? Rockets that could compete with the, the market of, or compete on the market with Rocket Labs. Uh, and what is the turnaround time of a booster uh, if recovery is possible? Uh, two excellent questions. So, uh, we do not, at least currently, plan to compete with uh, even Rocket Lab. Um, we want to see if uh, if SpaceX and Blue Origin are the, the freight train to space, and Rocket Lab is the bus to space, we want to be the Uber to space. Uh, with our business model, the goal is for Nanosat customers to be the primary payload, or to get that treatment. Uh, that they get to pick what orbit they want to go to, that they get to not be delayed uh, for, for months in some cases if the primary payload, somebody else's payload, uh, needs, needs something uh, done to it. And with our fuel and our modular engine and our small team, uh, we plan to do that cost competitively. So the plan currently does not call for a payload bay with a, a capacity greater than 30 kilograms. Uh, though that could change. As for the turnaround time of a booster, uh, technically all stages are just uh, clusters of that same uh, modular engine. The goal is to, well, I'm not going to say anything that just yet, because as we scale up, this, um, this hybrid engine uh, aboard Stardust 1.0 is about uh, six inches in diameter, and uh, our, our flight-optimized engine, which uh, we'll, we'll, you'll start to see on, on Stardust 2.0, and that's going to be the, uh, the 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 marvel that gets used on every uh, iteration after that, uh, and uh, just because we haven't finalized the design, I don't want to make any predictions on how quickly uh, a, a marvel will be refurbished. All I can say is watch this space. Someone G asks, as someone who just heard about Blue Shift today, well, welcome. Could you explain a bit more about your fuel architecture? Well, someone G, the uh, the fuel itself is proprietary. Um, it is a solid fuel. Uh, it is separate from the oxidizer. It is in a, a hybrid motor. We've got a liquid oxidizer and a solid fuel. Uh, they mix in the presence of an ignition source. 
and uh, that's how you uh, that's how you get your combustion. Now, uh, solid rockets have uh, incredible energy density, and liquid rockets have throttle ability, start start stop ability. And so, uh, I if if done effectively, a hybrid can kind of deliver the best of both worlds. Now, the the biggest challenge with hybrid is that because the solid fuel is the reaction chamber <laughs> itself, uh, your rocket engine is effectively changing shape as the pressure and temperature changes all around you. And so getting a stable uh, plume or stable combustion can be a little tricky. But uh, we're about to demonstrate that uh, we figured that out. If you're just joining us, this is a Blue Shift Aerospace live stream of the launch of Stardust 1.0, Maine's first commercial launch of a rocket, and uh, the globally the, the first launch uh, of a rocket for commercial purposes, powered by bio-derived fuel. Uh, we are on track for launch by roughly 3 p.m. as we heat the oxidizer and perform final system checks here at the Lime, uh, Loring Commerce Center in Limestone, Maine. A couple of uh, people that we should mention. So, uh, Sasha Derry is our founder and CEO. He founded uh, the Alta E store in 1999, uh, selling solar panels and uh, batteries and charge controllers and inverters. Uh, it's now a $24 million uh, dollar a year organization and uh, acquired uh, real goods. Uh, folks have maybe have read the, the Solar Living Source book. Um, but that, uh, that occurred in 2019. A little before that, he uh, founded Blue Shift in 2014. Brooke uh, Halverson, our, our lead test engineer, is responsible for working on performance uh, testing, logistics, manufacturing, and hybrid rocket 
motor assembly and testing. Luke Sandin, senior mechanical engineer, assists with the performance testing, oxidizer uh, system design and evaluation, MATLAB code development, and staging simulations. David Hayrickian, mechanical engineer, is experienced in five axis CNC milling, the founder of Maccabee Tech, and responsible for CAD CAM development of hybrid rocket motor components and developing production processes. Bonnie Etheridge, executive assistant, aka air traffic control has been working with Sasha for eight years now, which is uh, longer than anyone else on the Blue Shift team. Matt Parker, a technical advisor, experienced uh, aerospace professional with a focus in test and launch operations for propulsion systems. Led test engineering teams at SpaceX, where he helped develop, qualify, and produce Merlin engines for the Falcon 9 launch vehicle. Oversaw development operations of the Rutherford engine for Rocket Lab's Electron SmallSat launcher. And now manages the engineering team at Fiber Materials Incorporated here in Maine to develop advanced composite materials for missile defense and space systems. I'm Seth Lockman, Communications Director, uh, in charge of public, media, and government relations, and responsible for Blue Shift's uh, web video and social presence. Uh, we've had three interns to date, thanks to grants from the Main Space Grant Consortium. Uh, James Giltner assisted with layup of carbon fiber fuselage and the main rocket casing of Stardust. Uh, wired the uh, recovery tether and quick disconnect arms and helped with on-site testing and rocket stacking or integration. Ben Lemieux, mechanical engineering major at UMaine, wants to focus on rocket engines and aerospace engineering. Uh, he was integral in uh, rewiring the test stand as we upgraded to move from the 4-inch diameter to 6-inch diameter uh, Marvel prototype as part of the uh, NASA grant. And uh, he was able to uh, make it up to, to Limestone uh, today to help with, uh, with the launch. Kaylee Gallant helped model oxidizer uh, behavior in the tank, in the oxidizer tank during flight. And that very oxidizer tank uh, is now nearing the temperatures necessary to launch. And uh, David uh, just reached out to me through the work chat and then uh, pointed out we should thank Dragonplate for helping uh, hit all of our production deadlines.
if you're just joining us, this is a Blue Shift Airspace live stream of the launch of Stardust 1.0, Maine's first commercial rocket launch. And the first commercial uh, rocket launch uh, powered by a bio-derived fuel in the world. Just got the uh, update that launch is imminent. And here is the onboard camera, quality of signal. A uh, little bit of uh, buffering difficulty there. System has uh, resumed nominal function. We will go for live stream. We will go for launch.
Number nine. Number nine. Can you hear me? Is everyone ready? Lead test engineer Brooke Halverson, preparing to count down. And uh, looks like we're going to hold for a minute here. Uh, some snowmobilers passing on through. Resuming countdown. It's it. I've been maintained. Nine, eight, seven, six, five. Four, three, two, one. Ignition sequence start. Sirens running.
Okay. Yes, go. Oh my gosh. Oh, oh my gosh. Oh! <laughs> Fuck you! <yeah. laughs> Marvel has touched down. Pearl has touched down. Main shoot is down. And Stardust has touched down nominally within just a few hundred feet of the launch trailer. A beautiful flight. Definitely, definitely an atmosphere of celebration here at the launch site. Shoot is still uh, blowing in a gentle but steady wind.
right, we'll uh, have footage of the flight for you as soon as we can. All right, at this time, Kevin Bouchard of Frontier Transport is leading the uh, team of snowmobilers out with a, a sled fabricated just this morning to retrieve Stardust. Uh, looks like one of our cameras uh, got knocked over during the ascent there. Getting a lot of questions for footage, of course. Uh, we're going to get footage to you as soon as we can. Now, uh, if we can't do that in the next couple of minutes, um, there will be some high resolution videos on our YouTube channel in the coming days.
Yeah, we'll get those uh, stats for you guys as soon as we can as well. Well, unfortunately, <coughs> it looks like uh, there was an issue with the camera that would show the uh, rocket recovery. I can describe the scene to you from a distance, anyhow. Uh, there's probably 10 to 15 people out there now. Progressively, uh, more vehicles driving out there to get a closer look. Help with uh, recovery of stardust.
Now, because the flight was so nominal and Stardust landed so close to the launch site, we're probably going to go ahead, recover the payloads, hand them back to our customers, and then do a press debrief shortly after. If you're just joining us, this is a Blue Shift Aerospace live stream with the launch of Stardust 1.0. This was Maine's first commercial rocket launch, and this was the world's first launch commercially of a rocket powered by a bio-derived fuel. Engineers are on site assessing the condition of the Stroop waffles and other contents of our payload bay. And, uh, Final results will depend on, you know, review of all the telemetry, but just looking at it, that was a, a fairly nominal flight. We do have the launch on video, uh, just unfortunately there, there was like a network glitch at the moment of launch, um, but off network, uh, I know that uh, the NAC factory got video, the uh, BBC got video, and uh, I believe there were a number of other uh, uh, news agencies here that also got a good video and photo of the launch. So we'll get that to you just as soon as we can, uh, either as part of this stream or in uh, YouTube videos uh, soon to follow.
Alex Kimberly asks, how much development time went into this flight? Well, the company was uh, started after the biofuel was discovered in uh, late 2014. So you could consider all the time then to now to be uh, R&D time. Construction on Stardust itself began in earnest around May of this year. Or sorry, May of last year. Jono 2 asks, will the rocket be reusable? Well, I can't see it from here, but the flight was good, the landing was good. I would hazard the guess that Stardust 1.0 will be uh, refurbishable and, and reflyable. Uh, as to whether another flight will be necessary or we'll move straight to Stardust 2.0, uh, that remains to be decided on. And here comes uh, one of the volunteers from Frontier Transport with the Marvel, with the engine section of Pearl, sorry, of Stardust uh, on the sled. Pearl, of course, being the payload base section. Getting downlink from one of the cameras, payload bay camera. This half of Marvel is, uh, this half of Stardust, this is the Pearl. Uh, and it appears to be being loaded into another sled uh, out at the landing site.
Just looking at the marble, uh, you can see a little bit of a charcoal buildup from uh, one of the earlier uh, launch attempts in the day. So there's a little bit of soot. Uh, other than that, the engine looks okay. Blue Shift does have a Patreon and a merchandise store. So I'm seeing some questions about that if you want to support us and what we're doing. Help offset the, uh, the cost of engine tests and all the other R&D that goes into moments like this. Um, all of those uh, opportunities are on our website. Sadly, the... Uh, payload bay camera here uh, does not have a mic on it. So I, uh, I saw the request, but uh, sorry, I can't, uh, can't do that one. And that was uh, Luke and Brooke. Congratulations.
All right, the Blue Shift crew has returned to launch. Onboard camera still running. as we can. Uh, down a little bit. And the nose cone has been removed from the payload base. Onboard camera here. for our investors to help us go the next step. So right now we're extracting it off the payload bay. Luke is up high, taking out the bolts along with Brooke. We recovered this the main way using snowmobilers, snowmobiles from the Bouchard family here locally. They did a fantastic job for a moment, but minutes later, two little ladies found it out in the snowfield. So we're just waiting to remove the payload section off of 
off of uh, Stardust Pearl section. <laughs> and we are incredibly pleased with the launch. It couldn't have gone better once it lifted off. So we are delighted and it looks like the payloads are intact and we are excited to see, we are actually ex excited to hand them back to our customers. So I'll be happy to answer any questions you guys might have. Yes. Do you want to do that separately? To, to, to uh, press conference. Sure, I could probably do that in about 10 minutes, five, 10 minutes. Yeah, 10 minutes. Yeah. Uh, uh, any questions you guys might have? Do you think it'd be possible to launch this a second or maybe even a third time? So the question is do we think we would <coughs> we'd be able to launch this a second or third time? Yes. Uh, I think it's looking at facilities that are here, whether you want to do larger engine tests or just starting your company. This town is about aerospace, and there are already other aerospace companies here. It's another one of Maine's best kept, kept secrets. So I am hoping that this also, you know, our launch here also sheds a light on the opportunity here for other uh, entrepreneurs and other, uh, you know, even larger companies that want to want to start uh, to continue their business here in Maine and understand the resources they have here. It's it's a fantastic opportunity. Probably other lack of air traffic helped a lot. Yeah, we, we I think that that's it. so there was a lack of air traffic helping a lot. Yes, it was. We were able to get you know we were open to get a permit with the FAA and get a NOTAM a notice to airmen for two days if we needed. So that's not easy to do in every part of the United States. So uh, I th I think that's another great opportunity we have here in Limestone. Thank you. Yes. So um, if any schools want to put payloads on. Are you going to be working with schools to do things like that? Are you going to be doing outreach like that with other schools? Or how did you end up doing it with that school in particular? Yeah, so the question was, uh, are, if other schools are interested in launching with us, uh, could they do that? Yeah. And I will tell you this. Schools and academics, researchers, whether they're 10 years of age or 110 years of age, this is our core market. This is who we want to help out first. The, the researchers, the, our young scientists who are oldest scientists who want, ex, who want to send experiments to space, suborbitally or orbitally ultimately, that is, that is a key part of who we are targeting to help out. So the answer in short is yes. We would be delighted to talk to them and whether they're from Maine, the United, anywhere else in the United States, and we've already gotten interest from other countries in Latin America and, South, and actually from South Africa, we would be delighted to help out. This is, this is the core of what we want to do the next couple of years awesome. yeah thank, thank you. you sure and thank you for having us out today thank you for for freezing with us yeah. i really appreciate it and thank you for the donuts oh, yeah, you said, i know you said you had technical um issues today can you go more in depth about that uh so the question was uh we had technical issues today and what <clears throat> can we go more into that so yes we had uh, we had two technical issues we had an issue where our valve actuation the main valve that releases the oxidizer uh was under pressured uh, we addressed that issue pretty quickly uh, and got it up and running within about an hour. But then uh, we have a liquid, uh, it's a biodrive liquid that we use to ignite the, uh, the hybrid rocket. Uh, despite having done many tests, we've never seen that drop out. We actually emptied out the, that liquid. And that's what prevented uh, the ignition the second time around. It took a little while to recharge that. Uh, and then we had to bring the system back all totally up to pressure. Uh, and then, then we were fine. Then it was good. And then, of course, the clouds cleared, too. Mother Nature was delightfully wonderful for, with us. And now what's like, next for you guys? For the company? So the next steps for us, the big steps, is that we, the big part of why we're doing, we're doing this is to get private investment to take us forward to build Stardust 2.0 and Starless Raw Rogue, which will allow us to send uh, small payloads to space suborbitally. Uh, so we are now officially in the stage of seeking out private investors. And if folks are interested, uh, they should uh, go to our webpage or go to our YouTube page for a live stream event that we had, and they'll see the link if they're interested in becoming investors. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming again. <laughs> <laughs> and standing all, we're standing all the cold. Do you want to actually pull the payloads out? Or? Oh, yeah. yeah. I got one started for you. So. Oh, you did? Okay. It was dislodged. I'll give you the mic. Okay. This is live. <laughs> Oh, thank you, Luke. Uh, Where is Joe? What? Joe! You're the first contestant to receive your payload.
go. May I present you Hopefully. with oh. your. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you very much for flying with Blue Shift Aerospace. Congratulations <laughs> on a successful launch. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you Absolutely. for putting us in our very, very, very first launch. Yep. Thank you, sir. All right. Ashish, where's the, the right here, Ashish? Oh, you're here. Okay. There you are. Okay. Let's get out the film of Tyson. Ah, there's one that's jammed in with a the little. <laughs> there's a ladder over here. Blue well, I, I think we'll pull out rocket lab, hold rocket uh, insights. Hold on a second. We'll save this for later. All righty. Yeah, I'll get the pen. Thank you, sir. Yeah. There you go. Oh, look at that poor little. The his poor little. I got it out of there though, so he's he's intact. He's a little tweaked, but he's, he's not <laughs> mad. <laughs> I present you and the students of the Falmouth High School uh, with their payload. And thank you so much. Thank you guys very much for flying with Blue Shift Aerospace. We really appreciate the faith and we hope we're looking forward to their next experiment with us and hopefully to space very shortly. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm sure they'll be very happy to know that uh, you know this came back down safe. And congratulations on a successful launch. Thank you very much, sir. Thank yeah. you for coming. Absolutely. And carrying this cold. <laughs> and then we have the pens for, <laughs> for our potential investors. So. Okay. Yes, oh, and last but not least, we have what is perhaps the oddest payload to be launched by a rocket, uh, Stroopwafel. <laughs> Stroopwafel and tourmaline. So thank you very much, Rocket Insights, for flying with Blue Shift Aerospace. And that's a wrap. We have successfully launched the world's very first bio-derived uh, fuel rocket uh, with commercial <laughs> customers in the entire entire world. So thank you very much. Congratulations to the Falmouth kids too. Yes. And now it's time for some Stroopwafel. I'm just yeah. tired of <laughs> Now we gotta save it for these guys. Sure. <laughs> and I'm gonna hand the hot mic back to staff. Thank you. Concludes the uh, payload handoff ceremony there. With remarks from Sasha Dairy, founder and CEO of Blue Shift Aerospace. This has been Maine's first commercial launch and the first ever commercial launch of a rocket powered by a bio-derived fuel. The rocket is in good condition. The payloads are all in excellent condition. The team here is I would, I would describe it as giddy with success. Well, at the end of a long day, the end of a successful mission, 
I just want to uh, open things up once more to the to the comments. If anybody has any uh, parting questions. Uh, there's a very good question. Uh, Elizabeth Malloy asks, video, that's coming, sorry. Uh, Rocket Nerd was the one who asked, uh, is the Apogee known yet? It's just over 4,000 feet. Press conference has just been scheduled for 4.15 R-Drone UI. This was truly a great day for Blue Shift, for Maine, and uh, for aerospace, for humankind's impact on the environment. Okay. A good nominal flight of Stardust 1.0. promising sign as we uh, prepare to scale up and uh, keep doing what we're doing but more and better. So good evening from the Blue Shift crew, wherever you are, thank you so much for joining us, for being a part of this journey. Thank you for your enthusiasm and your questions. We'll see you at the next launch. Uh, keep an eye on our YouTube for those videos. Videos of the flight. But for now, for Blue Shift Aerospace, uh, this is Seth Lockman, over and out.